From Carriage to Riches, Story of Adobe. Leaving no stones unturned once again, we tell a true story of growth you've probably heard many times, because the story of success never gets tired of being told. And this time, it's the Garage to Riches story of Adobe. Today, you hear things like, Did you Photoshop this picture? Why does this image look Photoshopped? And many more. Adobe's products have not only become the face of the creative markets, but have also become verbs that people use in their day-to-day -day activities. Indeed, Adobe must have started somewhere, but where and how? In this video, we will see how the company grew into the giant it is today. We will also see their feats as well as their challenges. Follow us as we travel back to where it all started in the past couple of decades. Adobe started with two men, John Warnock and Charles Geshge in 1982. When they started, they had no workspace, so they used John's garage. And that is where it all began. But before John and Charles formed Adobe, they worked together as computer scientists for 16 years in Xerox Corporation's Palo Alto, Californian Research Center, also known as PARC. While at Xerox, these two men presented the idea of a programming language for printing. This language would enable better graphical quality and compatibility with any device. However, the Xerox bosses did not heed their pitch, so the duo decided to leave and start their own company. Before we go further, let us explain how printing works in those times. The printers then were dot matrix printers, and the output was so crude. Every line, shape or character printed had to be in a grid of dots. As you can imagine, typography was one of the major problems with this printer's output. The fonts would not appear on the printers as typed on the computer. Although another type of printer was invented, the laser printer was much better than the dot matrix. But it was not without its problems too. The first challenge was that it was only for Macintosh computers. Also, the typesetting required purchasing a system and a unique device compatible with the particular system alone. This means that you cannot use the printer with another device. This way, the only printer personal computers could still connect to is the dot matrix printer. John and Charles eventually launched their first product, called Postscript. Postscripts changed the entire printing technology because, for the first time, detailed and good quality printing was possible from any device. And in no time, Postscript became the industry standard for printing. So, John and Charles started a company called Adobe Systems Incorporated. The company's name Adobe was inspired by the Los Altos, California Creek that ran behind Warnock's home. The creek was called after a type of clay that was found there and this clay symbolizes the creative nature of the company's products. The stylized A in Adobe's corporate logo was created by Marva Warnock, John Warnock's wife, who was also a graphic designer. Within a year of Postscript's release, Adobe made over $83,000. This attracted many investors to the newly growing company. It also drew the attention of a man, Steve Jobs, founder of Apple Inc. Jobs offered to buy Adobe for $5 million, but the co-founders declined. Instead, they had a deal with him. They sold him shares that were worth 19% of the company. Seeing the company's potential, Jobs also paid five times the valuation of the company, and this became a game changer for the company. In fact, it became the first company in Silicon Valley to become profitable in the first year of its establishment. Jobs decided to implement the use of Adobe software Postscript while they produced the hardware. So in 1985, Apple licensed Postscript in their laser printers. And this act revolutionized the printing and publishing industry. It also took a toll on Xerox, because people had to jettison the use of photo typesetters for Postscript-enabled printing. Before this, people used photo typesetters produced by Xerox for digital publishing. Now, all you need is a Macintosh and a laser printer, and you can start publishing. Besides the lesser quality compared to the new player, photo typesetters were too expensive, so the market became unfavorable for Xerox. This might have been why Xerox bosses refused the idea of John and Charles in the first place, but what they ran away from returned to haunt them most unexpectedly. Adobe and Apple's alliance became stronger over time, and in 1987, Adobe decided to enter the consumer market, and they did this by launching Illustrator, a vector-based graphics software. However, Illustrator was only available for Macintosh, and that was only the beginning. The next software launched by Adobe was Photoshop. However, let us tell you a story about Photoshop that might differ from what you have heard. Photoshop was initially created by two brothers, Thomas and John Knoll. Thomas Knoll was a lifelong enthusiast of photography. 
He used to work on photography the majority of the time. In his basement, he maintained a dedicated darkroom for film development. In 1987, Thomas Knoll built a computer application on his Macintosh Plus to display grayscale photographs on a monochrome monitor. He called it Display. His brother John Knoll was immediately interested in Display, so he proposed that Thomas expand it into a full-fledged image editing program. The two brothers then worked together on the concept. Finally, they were able to code it and create the first photo editing program. In 1988, the brothers were able to sell the software's license to Adobe, and the popularity started growing. Adobe Photoshop became the industry standard for digital image editing. Today, Photoshop is the most used graphic and image editing software, carrying about 36% of the market. Adobe Systems began to grow, and both co-founders were doing well. However, the enemy was lying in wait for them. Charles Geshke almost lost his life when he was kidnapped. On May 26, 1992, Charles was in his green Mercedes 500 SL, parked at his Silicon Valley office. A grey Ford rolled into the parking lot. A young man carrying a map stepped out. The man asked Charles, Do you work here? And Charles replied, Can I help you? Thinking the man was looking for a direction. The man moved closer to him and shoved a gun in his face. They grabbed him and he was gone. The person holding the map turned out to be a kidnapper and the person driving the Ford was his accomplice. Later in the afternoon, the kidnappers called Nancy, Charles' wife. The caller insisted that she needed to pay attention. Her husband had been kidnapped and transported away from the state. Charles would be dismembered and left on her doorstep if she disagreed with their requests. She was instructed to get her husband's car out of the Adobe Systems parking lot by 5 o'clock, come up with $650,000 and remain silent because she was being watched and followed. Because she was too afraid to call from her home, she decided to find a public phone and notify Adobe Systems CEO John Warnock in case he was the next target. As she entered Mountains View downtown, she was sure someone was following her. As a former Special Libraries Association chapter president, Nancy went to a place she was familiar with and pleaded to use a fellow librarian's office phone. She told John to meet her at Rancho Shopping Center at 3.30 p.m. She also called two stockbrokers and instructed them to liquidate stock into $100 bills within 10 days. Nancy changed cars, changed clothes in the Adobe Systems parking lot and took a different route home. She then took to the streets of Los Altos for three miles while zigzagging in the hopes that her captors wouldn't identify her. She casually handed John a letter at Rancho Market that summarized the day's activities and stated how they could reach her. John told his wife about the situation and the wife suggested they call the FBI while John kicked against the idea. Eventually, they called the FBI. Nancy was at the television studio she had told John about when an FBI agent showed up and led her back to the Warnocks, where she was questioned for hours. The FBI agents determined Kathy, Charles' daughter, should answer the kidnappers' calls. She would likely be at the house since she had just a few days off from school. They worked to create a narrative in that Nancy was unwell and Kathy traveled to take care of her. When it was time to deliver the ransom, an FBI agent hid in the car that Kathy drove, while other agents and a SWAT team were also closing in on the location. Only one of the kidnappers came, who Charles later called Steve. They arrested him, and he took them to where they were holding Charles. The two men were sentenced to life imprisonment, while the Geshkes tried returning to their normal lives. Following the kidnapping of Charles, Adobe Systems grew rapidly. Between 1995 and now, the company has acquired over 50 companies. Some of their recent acquisitions include ContentCal, Frame.io, Workfront, Oculus Medium, Allegro Rhythmic, Marketo, and Magneto. In 2018, Adobe officially changed its company name from Adobe Systems Incorporated to Adobe Inc. And now, Adobe has over 50 products in the creative market. Adobe's revenue increased by 54.2% from 2016 to $9 billion in 2018. By 2021, its sales were projected to rise 53% to around $14 billion. And at the end of 2021, the company had over $15 billion in revenue. Honestly, the company hit that mark and above. The journey, however, was not without bumps. Even though Adobe's products were successful, they did have their failures too. One of their failed product is Flash. What is Flash? FutureWave software created a program called SmartSketch before it finally evolved into Adobe Flash. 
Released in 1993, Smart Sketch was merely a vector drawing program for pen computers. Later, the app was upgraded to include frame-by-frame -frame animation capabilities, becoming Future Splash Animator for Mac and PC. But later, in 1996, Macromedia acquired Flash and decided the product be split into two. Animations would be produced using Macromedia Flash, and anyone with Flash Player could view them without purchasing additional software. Importantly, Macromedia built a Flash Player web browser plugin that allowed animations to function inside web pages. In 2005, Adobe acquired Macromedia, changing the product's name from Macromedia Flash to Adobe Flash. However, Flash's fall began when Steve Jobs published an article titled Thoughts on Flash. He argued that Flash was buggy and had security flaws. In his words, Flash is a spaghetti ball piece of technology that has lousy performance and terrible security problems. He also said that the program was sapping battery power, failing to support touch-based devices and having technical and security drawbacks. Afterwards, Jobs banned the use of Flash in Apple products and used HTML5 instead. And indeed, in 2011, Adobe stopped using Flash on mobile devices and switched to HTML5. But that was not the end. And finally, in 2020, Adobe stopped the production of Flash. However, some have said that one of the reasons Steve Jobs criticized Adobe's Flash was Adobe's alliance with Bill Gates of Microsoft. People argued that this had made Adobe neglect the production of their products for Apple products. If that was true, we'd never know. Another big issue they faced started settling in 2013 when Adobe moved from CS, Creative Suite, to CC, Creative Cloud. Well, what does that mean? In CS, users can pay for the license of the software once and it will last a lifetime. But CC is a subscription-based use. Users pay as they use. And this caused uproar as many people said the software would become too expensive with time. At first, it took a toll on Adobe, but they eventually bounced back up. The history of Adobe is a journey of transformation. A company that started in a garage eventually became the creative market's cornerstone. They have experience with several software eras and are trying to succeed in the current one. They're doing a fantastic job thus far, making difficult long-term decisions and being extremely focused on how they can expand and provide new value to customers are the only ways they can maintain the growth and success they've seen. Thank you for watching. This is Skillset and we will see you in the following video. Don't forget to like and let us know your thoughts in the comments.